Good morning. We hope to see you on 3rd of April. 1st of April, if you come, I'll see you in office. <laughs> uh, yes, we are living in times that uh, I know uh, I have people even ask, Pastor, are you reconsidering closing the service? I was like, I said, I will be one of the hard hardest part for me to explain to the whole world as to why we close our service when you go to work and you go to supermarket and you go to restaurant and you go on holidays. But don't come to church because people can die one. No. Uh, just in case of you don't even know, uh, we do wipe every seats after the service. That's why we have a COVID team. And after the service, after your leave, we do spray. Some of you say, really? Uh, you say, no. Uh, then just stay a bit longer and we will smoke you with the disinfectant. Okay? So that is our part of our SOP that we do. We do all we can to make sure that the place is as clean as possible. And we do hope that uh, you yourself do the same in keeping yourself uh, healthy and safe. Amen? But I think it is so important that we do not walk in fear. We walk in awareness that, uh, yes, this is something that is going to be there uh, generally for the rest of our lives. Uh, as long as this world, uh, as the Bible talks about, is uh, corrupted and will deteriorate as the day of the Lord approaches, uh, there will be wars, rumors of wars, and we already heard of wars and uh, sickness and all that, they will happen. So there's something that we can't hide ourselves, but rather our faith needs to be strong in the Lord, to trust that He leads us in times of darkness too. As today's message is called Faith in the Dark. <laughs> Amen? So uh, we really encourage you, if you can, do come back to church. Uh, and um, I, I was reminded of what one pastor said, that today, due to COVID, uh, there is a different brand of church that has come about. Uh, it is called the Pajamas Church. And uh, where, you know, and yeah, it really struck me as to whether uh, honoring the Sabbath is a vital thing in our lives anymore. And of course, people will argue and say, yeah, I am. I'm switching on my channel and all that. But while you're watching and you're eating your breakfast and you go off to the kitchen and you wash your car and you come back, ah, what you say, ah, rewind, rewind. And then, uh, you know, you're in pajamas and you know, you're kissing your husband and then you're stroking your cat and then, then chasing your dog. Hey. And then you say, yeah, this morning, I really honor the Sabbath. I don't know. There's something that we as Christians really need to uh, rethink our worship. Amen? Uh, I'm not scolding you all, but you have to think for yourself as to how do we balance all this, yeah? And uh, are we able to give attention? In fact, even I know in this service, sometimes people also keep paying, cannot pay attention. While I'm speaking, you're also speaking at the same time. So, so I should stop talking. Go to the sermon. Lord, we thank you for today. Speak to us and challenge us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now we have been looking at uh, Joshua, we have been looking at uh, chapter 1 all the way to chapter 6 last week. We see how the children of Israel was brought to the edge of the River Jordan. Uh, and they have been given a choice whether they want to move on and they have to move on. That's why we call our series entitled Where They Have Been and Where They Must Go. And likewise for Christians, for us, even in all our spite of circumstances around us, we have to go on. The call to press on is always a vital part of our Christian walk. There is no stagnation. We are never called to, 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 to the stay put, but we are all called to go on a journey. And the ch children of Israel cross, they build a memorial. You know, God, they consecrate themselves, they circumcise themselves. God removed their reproach. And last week we saw they had a mighty victory with Jericho, a story we all know. Uh, they, all they need to do was march around the city and march more times on their last day and give a big shout. And the walls collapsed, and they all knew that really that battle belongs to the Lord, not to them. Amen? What a mighty victory. But in every victory, okay, let me get my slide movie. In every victory, the enemy would always want to challenge you after a mighty victory to test your faith. Now that you are up there, let's see really you can stand up there. Yeah? It sounds like office politics, right? Oh, somebody promoted well, May got promoted. I mean, she retired already. Nah. Just example. Yeah? She got promoted. Well, let's see how long she stays in that position. Yeah? And sometimes it's like that. I'm not sure about your office. You know? Or, or you know, or office politics. Say, wow, let's see. Lah. And the enemy sometimes say, wow, you win a Jericho. Let's see lah, how strong you are. And guess what? Today's chapter 7 
shows the downfall of the children. It's like immediately after the battle, chapter 6 tells us about how they won a battle, they did what uh, they were supposed to do by God, and then chapter 7 opens up with this first verse. He says this, but the Israelites, okay, it's always very interesting when the first word of that passage starts with a but, yeah? So that means, this was what they did, but the Israelites were unfaithful in regards to devoted things. Achan, Achan, or if you are Chinese, Achan, son of Karami, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. Okay, so if you say God doesn't know your grandparents, he knows them. See, all there. Son of Karami, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, three generations. The tribe of Judah, which clan, Hainanese, Hokkien, whatever, so he knows. Took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now, this is very important. Verse 1 is something that Joshua and the leaders, the elders, do not know about. They have no information about this thing that has happened. Neither has does the, all the children of Israel, they do not know because Achan did this secretly. He did it secretly. He took those things and hid it in his tent. No one knew. It was a secret. When you have to hide something, you don't want others to see. Yeah? It is done in darkness. It is done in the shadows. No one knows about it. That's why it's a secret. And all of us, Okay, I wouldn't say all of us. Most of us might have secret issues in our hearts. You know, we put on a personality. People know us for our personality. And so they give us something that is called a reputation. Reputation is what people say we are. Personality is what we portray. Character is who we are when no one sees. Whether in the midst of where no one sees, our faith still holds in the midst of darkness. And Akin or Achan, Aiken, no, he decided to do something secretly that no one knew. No one knew. Now guess what? When you think that no one knows, the Bible says God knows. That's the reason why verse 1 is there, because God knows. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. So that's why verse 1 is there, because God knew. So if you and I are struggling with things that we think, hey, other people don't need to know, God knows. And in the process of building up His children, growing up His children, God would always want to deal with those things. Whether it is uh, what we call in English, skeleton in a closet. Things you don't want people to know. God wants to deal with it because He wants to break the seed, the enemy souls in each one of our lives, so that darkness has no hold over our lives. Amen? Hold that in your mind. So let's continue on. Verse 2, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, to the east of battle, and told them, Go up and spy the region. So the men went up, spy out Ai, and when they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not vary the whole army, for only a few people live there. After a mighty Jericho fell, they look at I. This is a small town. You don't waste your time. Okay? So about 3,000 of them went up, but they were routed or defeated by the men of I, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Remaining there till evening, the elders of the Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, listen to what Joshua said, sounds very familiar. Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to deliver us in the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Have you ever sound, you know, in playing music, when we play certain things in different keys, but the idea is the same, so we call it the same motive. You know, you go, ding, 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 and you go, ding, ding, ding. It's the same thing. Yeah? Have you, do you hear the same thing? Remember when the children of Israel was in the wilderness? Oh, God, why did you bring us here in the wilderness to die? You shall have left us in Egypt. And now Joshua says, oh, God, why did you bring us here? We should have died, at least died across that side. You know, our parents were buried that side. <laughs> why here? 
If only we had been content to stay on the other side of Jordan. Wow, what a change. After a mighty victory, look at the prayer of Joshua. Yep. We should have stayed back there. We should be happy there. At least those two and a half tribes were smart guys. We were the dumb fellas to cross here. And now, 36 of us die. What can I say now? Israel has been routed by its enemies. The Canaanites and other people of the country will hear about this. They will surround us and wipe our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name, Lord? Wow, you see a big change? When they crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, the people in Jericho were in great fear because they heard the children of Israel has crossed the Jordan and God was with them. He opened the Jordan, they crossed. The people were trembling in fear. That was stated right in Jericho. And now the whole thing turned the other way. Fear has come into the camp of the Lord instead of the enemy. What a reminder. What a reminder. Because the circumstances out there started to dictate Joshua and the people. They started to see some defeats, some stumbling, and now fear creeps into the camp of the Lord. Today, the same question God would ask us, has fear crept into the church of Jesus Christ? And that's something we only can answer. Because our God gives us courage to master fear. And our God is before us. And that's a challenge. It is no point to study Joshua, study books, Bible, and become very intelligent here. And I know some Christians like to talk about it. I have done Bible study with people. And it's very a waste of time because the Bible study is, all, is around here. Anyway. Yes, the Greek word is like that. You speak Greek. No, no, no. It not matter. I, I don't speak Greek, but I read somewhere. The Greek word means this. Allah, you don't speak Greek, no need to say the Greek word. Lah. Yeah, you don't speak Hebrew, also don't need to say. Right? It's because somebody said. <laughs> yeah? You know when Christians say, you know actually uh, the Bible, uh, they actually translate it wrongly. You know? you know, let me put it on screen uh, if you're watching for overseas. When you say it often enough, you're telling people the Bible is translated wrongly. And it's full of crap, your opinion. Do you, do you wonder what you say? You know, actually, uh, they should actually translate the words like that. Because uh, the Hebrew uh, means like that. Well, you're a professional scholar, is it? You are an expert in translation. When they translate the Bible, you think one man, just like the Passion Bible, which people don't encourage you to read because it's translated by one man only, so I translate according to what I like. But when the NIV, NKJV, all that is translated by a group of scholars, it has to be checked, double-checked, triple-checked before you print it out. Yeah, why I'm saying that is, is a dangerous thing. You can say, well, another word for it can be read as this. But don't ever say, you know, actually, uh, they should translate like that. Wow, you translate. Lah. Then you translate the time, you see where you buy the Bible. But when you say it like that, you know what unbelievers say? There, I told you. See, I told you. Huh? Told you, the Bible translated wrongly. One. Proof the Muslim say is correct. And who are the fellows who say that? Christian. Too much intelligence about Bible study. Not that Bible study is wrong, but we are very happy about information, very little about application. And the Bible talks about if you don't do what you read, there's information only. I know, lah, yes, this one say, the Greek word say that, the one say that, and this one. Actually, uh, Joshua do this, do that, do that. How does it apply to you? That is not important. You see, uh, what Joshua should do, they should have worn a new balance shoe. They would go on better, longer distance. It's like, okay. But it's important for us to know that as Christians, we come to a point in history where no longer it's just about information. Information outside there. That's why uh, parents, oh, you know, with COVID, uh, it has proven a point. You don't need to send your children to, to medical university. You know why? Because there are so many graduates from Google University. Ever since COVID came out, right? So many experts, right? You, what's the point of actually go to hospital? Because there's so many experts. Even if the doctor says something, you will probably say, no, 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 because Dr. Google says something else. Likewise, it's the same thing. Think about that, yeah? Let me move on. My timekeeper say, move. So the first point, the lure of sin. Yeah, I'm going to point out this, yeah. 
This is what Achan said when he was caught. He says, when I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia. Think of the things that he took. Huh? Now you must imagine this. Yeah, he took it alone. Okay? So it must be something that he can take without people seeing. You know? If you can drag a washing machine around, it's going to be a bit difficult to, to, to escape. You get what I'm trying to sing the logic here? And that is not reading Hebrew or Greek into it. Right? I'm just looking at the picture. He got to take something that nobody can see and you're living among two million people. Okay? So you got to take things that you can move. One rope from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, so he must have very deep pockets. And a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. I hope his stomach is very big. I mean, somewhere they hide it. I covered them, took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers. They ran to his tent. And there he was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. Look at the words that is said here. And look at how the progression of sin from temptation happens. I saw. I covered it. I won. I took. Doesn't it remind you of something? For in the Garden of Eden, Eve saw and that the fruit was desirous. She wanted it, she coveted it, she took it. And likewise, the progression of temptation to sin is the same. And every day we face the same progression. You will see it. The enemy will put it before you. You sign this contract, one million is yours. Nobody needs to know. Think about it. The moment the word says, think about it, guess what you're going to do when you go home? You're going to think about it. <laughs> and you think long enough, what you can do with one million, you want it. You're covered after it. And then the next thing you will say, I took it. This is a very simple progression. From the Garden of Eden here to Aiken, it's the same. I saw, I covered, I took. So the moment that you and I see, we have to stop it there. And that is always the difficult things. Yeah. The Bible says this, covetousness is idolatry. Yeah. Therefore, consider members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, to passion, to evil desires, and to greed or covetousness, which amounts to idolatry. So that covetous heart, that greed within Achan, he wanted that, is idolatry. In other words, when you think of that thing long enough, it becomes your God. That's why it's idolatry. When you go home, and someone says they offers you five million, you mandi lima juta, you makan lima juta, yeah, you tido lima juta, you bera also lima juta. Everything in your thinking is on that. So who is God? That five million is becomes your God. That's why it becomes idolatry. That covetousness thing. That thing that you covered now becomes the most important thing in your heart and your mind. Amen? So stolen water, the prophet says, is sweet and bread eaten in secret and pleasant. But he does not know the dead are there. Oh, very direct, right? Stolen bread, nice. Nice to taste. No one knows. But at that point of participation, guess who is part of that bread maker? Death. You bring death by participating in it. Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth will be full of gravel. You know? When they bury you, it's full of gravel. What a reminder. Yeah? It's nice to take stolen fruit, but then it will bring death. Firstly, as Christians, death to your spiritual world. And if you don't repent, death permits in your life. So the lure of sin is so important. Remember the steps. Saw, covered, took it. Amen? Second thing, understand this. The consequences of your action. There are always consequences to your action. Yeah, every choice has its consequences. We all know that. We are old enough to understand 
that thing. You make a choice this morning to come. The consequence is listening to what I'm speaking right now. Yeah? So that's part of it. So number one, here, it angers God. We have been... Uh, people have twisted the gospel and put it in such a way that, you know, the Old Testament God is angry God. The New Testament God is loving God. And therefore, God who loves people will never send people to hell one. But an angry God in the Old Testament is somewhere along the line, in the middle of the 400 silent years, God took a personality change. No. The loving God is still just. And yeah, it's just that, you know, when the New Testament doesn't talk about it, it is a very funny thing. Because we don't see Revelation as a big deal. Because when Revelation happens, that God that you say who is loving will instill justice on all. So by then, I'm sure those people who say, God who is loving is never angry. Well, Jesus demonstrated it by overturning the tables in the temple. Yep. So think about that. So disobedience to God always brings consequences. The Lord said to Joshua, Joshua was praying on his ground, lamenting, Oh God, why are you bring us here? We should die. And look at what God said. God said to Joshua, Stand up, man. In other words, for goodness sake, what are you doing on your face? That's what God is saying. What are you doing down on your face? Yeah. In other words, stop this nonsense. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them in their own possessions. That is why Israel cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs, run, because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Now, this is very important to understand. I said it previously. God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, covenant-fulfilling God. We must understand it. On that framework of His covenant, His plans is revealed in Israel and through Israel and in the world. So covenants that God made is very important. Because of the covenant, Israel today will never let go Jerusalem and promise them. Why? Because God covenanted that He gave that land to them. You say, where did God say means you didn't listen to the sermon, go back three weeks. Yeah, in Genesis 12 and Genesis 17, God says to Abraham, your descendants will be, you know, like sands on the the stars in the skies, you will be a blessing to the nation, and I will give you this land, Canaan. Genesis 17, all the way back then. On that covenant, Israel proceeds into the promised land. This is why they crossed the Jordan. Okay? And so God is a covenant-making, keeping, and fulfilling God. Now, we say, what's the big issue about Achan take one robe, some coins of silver, and go? What is the big deal? The big deal is in Genesis, in Joshua chapter 6, we didn't read last week. This is what God said. God says, this is what will happen when you go to Jericho. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourself will be completely destroyed. And you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. What will happen? God says, don't touch anything that is supposed to be meant for destruction. If you do that, two things will happen. You will bring trouble to yourself and you will bring trouble to Israel. So, are they having trouble right now? Yes. Okay. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, iron is sacred to the Lord, must be brought into his treasury. Then they burn the whole city. There's Jericho, everything in it. They put the silver, gold and articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. Wow. This is what God told them. Now what's the big deal? What's wrong with one nice, beautiful robe from Babylon and some gold and silver? It's because all those things were attached to the spirit of a culture that is linked to abomination and worship of idols. And therefore to God, those things you shall not touch. Yep. That's the reason why when we go on holidays, we don't buy nice figurines. You say, we are so cute, man, this boy. What is that? Oh, that is our God of fertility. Oh, so cute. Put in the room. Lah. Hey, Pastor, 
a house, uh, see something. Ah, there's something strange in your house, right? Why? You see, but it's just a statue. Yes, it's just a statue. But it receives authority because people worship it. And that becomes a point of contact because you bring it into your house. Now, it's not a big deal to people. It's maybe a house of a deaf mask, la, all these kind of things. And you say, you nuts case, la, you Christian, everything. So, no, those things are linked to a culture that is given to abomination. Yep. Let's look at Deuteronomy. You must burn their idols in fire. You must not cover the silver or gold that covers them. You must not take it or it will become a trap to you for it is detestable to the Lord your God. Do not bring any detestable object into your home for then you will be destroyed just like them. You must utterly detest such things for they are set apart for destruction. Okay? I didn't say it. Yeah. Deuteronomy 32. They stirred up his jealousy by worshipping foreign gods. They provoked his fury with detestable deeds. They offered sacrifice to demons who are not God, to gods they had not known before, to new gods only recently arrived, to gods their ancestors had never feared. It is so important to know that it's not, it's not about the robe, the silver and gold. Yes, one, it is linked to uh, you know, worship of idols and linked to a, uh, to a culture that is connected to abomination. But more so, you break the instruction that God has given See, when we come to this issue, a lot of Christians say, what's the big deal about one Rome and this anima? Nothing big deal about it, what? But the biggest deal is you did not follow what God instructed. And that is something that a lot of Christians don't understand. That's why but the Bible says there is a way that seems right to men. But the end of it is death. And you can make a choice. And God says, if you choose that way, I told you so, there leads to death. Someone says this, God's anger is kindled not because we have harmed him, but because we have harmed ourselves. We have harmed ourselves. It's just like you as parents, you tell a child, don't touch that kettle. It is hot. And when they touch it and they start crying, did it hurt you? Yes, it hurt you because it hurts your child. But more so, it harmed that child. But the very thing is that you deal with the issue or not, about you being stupid, dumb, or whatever, is that you disobeyed the instruction given. Now, as parents, you say, I understand that. And likewise, it's the same thing. God is our Heavenly Father. He tells us, don't go there. Don't touch that. It's not going to be helpful. It's going to bring you more harm. In these last days, there are a lot of people saying, no, no, God, God, we are matured people, science, technology, we are the woke generation. We know what we need to do. And in these end days, the wrath of God is going to be revealed from heaven against godlessness and wickedness of people who know the truth but suppress it by their own wickedness. And that's the danger. And sometimes we think, oh, it's the world. Who knows more truth than the world? All of us. If you know the word, the truth sets you free. And if you know it, and you suppress it by your own, oh, nah, don't mind, one. it's okay. Right? It's not a big deal. You choose to suppress the truth with wickedness. Firstly, okay? Secondly, <clears throat> sin affects the nations. <clears throat> the moment God, Achan did that, God linked it to Israel. That's it. You are part of Israel, so one guy did it, everybody affected. Yeah? As the Malay would say, it's a Setitik nila merosakkan sebelangga susu. Okay, one uh, one drop of dye will just destroy the whole pot of milk. The whole color will change. Your white milk becomes red color now because you drop one drop of red dye. Yep. One person's action, the ripple effect, affects the whole nation. It's always very interesting to ask yourselves if a nation is going through so much hassle and we pray for our nations. <clears throat> Is the church of Jesus Christ in Malaysia right standing before God? And I'm sure from a distance, some people say, that's why they should stay at home. Are we right 
We pray for nations, right? We pray for revival, awakening. But yet, <clears throat> we don't really want to do more than that. It is nice to pray because it's only prayer, and prayer is what I do, and nothing else will do. So it's prayer is cheap. I need to pray anymore. I tell the Tungling students, if you are a student, one of your students needs $200 to pay for the book, and 20 of you are praying, no need to pray. La. Oh, pastor, why no need to pray? This time I think I ask God. God say, use your brain. He shall give $10, $200 already. Pray who? Pray for the lecturer to give money to the student. La. 20 of you, you shall give $10. How much is that? $200. Pray what some more? You don't plan to be an answer to your prayer? Somebody else be an answer to that prayer? Sometimes Christian very funny. Oh God, you know, this send five hundred dollars to the missionary. They need five hundred dollars. You got five hundred dollars or not? I got, but then uh, I don't give. Actually, oh God, I pray for Shem to give. It's like sometimes a simple. It's not not to say don't pray. The answer is right before you, but we choose not to be part of the answer. We just just choose to be it. Sin <clears throat> renders us ineffective in life's battle. Yeah. Obviously, we all know that they were defeated. I'm not going to read the scripture again. You know, they sent two, three thousand people, and the enemy attacked and defeated them. They killed 36 of them. Yep. Basically, when sin comes into your life, you become ineffective to handle battles that you have. Basically, having sin in your life, as I said, basically puts you in a place of defenselessness into battle. We are called to put on the armor of God. Yeah. But moment when sin comes into our life, it removes the breastplate of righteousness in our lives. It cuts our communication with God, yep, and leaves us defenseless. Why? Because God does not listen to prayer when there is sin in the camp. And that's so important to know that. So we can be in church, but not deal with sin in our lives. And pray, saying, see, God never do anything. Pray is the same. Or we think that we are fine because we do the necessary thing. But as long as sin is in our lives, it removes our connection with God. Yep. And so until they deal with those sin, yep, you can never overcome it. And that's why we are rem- they, the, children, the Bible tells us that they need to deal with the sin before they can move on. And so the call, if you look from chapter 1 to chapter 7 right now, the, the one key word has been constantly said, consecrate, 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 circumcise, consecrate. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourself in preparation, for this is what the Lord of God Israel says. Consecration is where we give ourselves to God so that then God can sanctify us. And that's why Paul says we need to offer ourselves as living sacrifices constantly, and if you say God is not loving, I praise God that God is gracious enough to tell the children of Israel, consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself is God is saying, I give you another chance. In other words, God is saying, you know, my call as your Heavenly Father is greater than the fall. You understand? The fall that we have in our lives is never greater than the call of a Heavenly Father. And so you might fall and you might stumble, and you, but you pick yourself out and you heed the call of Father and come towards Him. Consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself. Yep. And when you do that, God will do something in your life to bring a breakthrough. Amen? Next one. Sin hurts others. We all know that. Just because of one guy, 36 fellows died. Imagine that. Yeah, 36 people died. Your fault, 36 people died. People got killed. People got discouraged. Fear came into the camp. And even Joshua sounded defeated in his prayer, remember? Just that there are consequences to our action. You know, obviously we know sin brings about judgment of God. Unrepentant sin withholds and cuts off the blessing of God. It chokes and paralyzes the body of Christ. That is so important. And so it's a reminder, it affects a nation. And every nation, the church of Jesus Christ is the salt and light of the world. And it is the call to reflect Christ. It is called to preserve the goodness of God in that land. And that is so important. That, you know, that's why the Bible talks about judgment always begins in the house of God. It has to. Why? Because 
then the light can shine brightly. Then the soul still retains its flavor. And so judgment will always happen. That's why it's so important okay, to always come you know, and repent us before the Lord. Whoever is caught with devoted things shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. <clears throat> See what happens to Achan. Joshua says in verse 25, Why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all of Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. There is a penalty to pay for it. Yeah, we say, wow, stone, man, this is old fashion. Yeah, because this happened in the Old Testament. Today, if you did something that is wrong before the law, you have to go to jail, even if you are a Christian. Yeah? Sin is always against God. That's why David, Psalm 51, is David's cry to the Lord after he sinned against God. He says, Against you alone have I sinned. What is evil in your sight I have done? You are right when you pass sentence and blameless in your judgment. This is what David said. You are blameless in your judgment. We all know this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That is so important. You say, what's the big deal again about Achan? He just took one robe and some silver and gold. Well, just for the sake of... Okay, putting aside the covenant, let's look at the Ten Commandments. First commandment, he chose all those things above God. So you shall have no other gods except God himself. <clears throat> Eighth commandment, he stole. Nine command, ten commandment, he coveted. And nine commandment, he lied. So for the sake of argument, he said, okay, put aside the covenant God said about Jericho. Ten commandments, did he fail? Yes. And for the wages of sin, it's death. Think about that. Now you might say, it will never happen to me. How many of you know David is called the man after God's heart? Any of you during church camp, seminars, and quiet time, the Spirit of God came and said, you are the girl after my heart. Or the boy after my heart. You are the man. Shem after my heart. Anyone? There's a voice come over. You are the woman after my heart. Anyone? Boa, I say man. If you don't have eyes, you don't have. <clears throat> and David, given that term forever, all eternity people read, David is the man after God's heart. He also failed God. Why can't it happen to us? <clears throat> okay, I'll leave it as that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sin destroys people nearest to us. And we all know that, that when Achan was killed, he, in everything that he owns and his family, they will all face the same judgment. That is sad. That is sad. <clears throat> yep. Then Joshua, together with Joshua, took Achan's son, the rope, passed, his cattle, donkey, sheep, his tent, all that he had. And they were killed and they were burned and they were placed, they covered it with stones. And that place has been called the Valley of Akor ever since. So that it's a reminder to people of what happens to those who choose to disobey the things of God. As much as a memorial stones had it when they crossed the River Jordan and said, this is what God did. Yet that valley, this is what happens when Israel failed. <clears throat> Proverbs 6.27 says, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? What a good reminder. Memorize this scripture. In other words, if we play with fire, don't think you will not be burned. Amen? <clears throat> Let me end now. End, because still a point. End. <laughs> How then we respond to the snare of sin? We have to see that sin is a snare. It is a trap. I know some of you are long-time Christian. I know, Pastor, I know, as I said. David also knew. <laughs> yeah, because we know so much that sometimes we assume that we know better than others and it will never happen to us. That's why there are a lot of Christians who say persecution will never happen in our country, when, uh, our nation, or this. It will never happen because today is modern times. If you take a tabulation of persecution and people who die for Christ, 
There are more people that die in the 20th century for Christ than those during the Romans. Do you know that? Just that we have pictures, or they went to the lion there, all there, they go to Colosseum, you know, they were all sacrificed, they died. But there are more Christians who die in, in, in North Korea, Middle East, in all the other parts of the world. You tabulate in the 20th century, then during the early church. Yeah? Sin is a snare. So what do we do? We need to be aware and watchful. In other words, don't be MCC, don't be Mong Cha Cha, don't be blur. Okay, and say it, it will never happen to you. James 1 okay, says this, But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Our desire, our lust, serves as a bait. And the, de- the devil will bait you and draw you in. And when it starts to breathe, you cover it, it starts to give birth, and it will lead you to a path of destruction. That's why the Bible tells this, be watchful, stand firm in the faith. I like this, act like men. And ever since a certain politician group says, by a women's group, so I can say to all the women, oh, act like men. Yeah? Act like men, be a man. In other words, stand strong. Let all that you do be done in love. He said, how do you define love? 1 Corinthians 13. Lah. Go to the next wedding and hear if you don't have your Bible. Love is patient, does not insist on its own, does not record the wrong, bears all things, endures all things, hopes all things. That is love. In other words, not in lust. Not in the lust of the flesh, not in the lust of the eyes, not in the pride of life, but in love. To be action that is done in love. So as Christians, in dealing with this, we need to be aware and watchful. Secondly, we need to remember God reigns. Somehow, we Christians have mistakenly un, uh, don't understand what it means to be under a king. We think that God is a prime minister that is up for election every few years or president. And we have a right to tell the president or prime minister what we want. But I'm sorry to tell you, the Bible tells us God has a system of government called theocracy. And what theocracy means that he is king and that's it. You say, huh? Like that? Huh? You watch so many Korean movies, you don't know. Huh? All the old movie, The king say, you shut up. Right? No. Wrong movie. I watched the wrong one. Huh? The Chinese one. I say it so many times. When the order comes from the king, oh, everybody... Receive right now the order of the king. You will go to Timbuktu and stay there for the rest of your life. You leave tonight. Thank you very much. Right, not? Thank you very much. Uh. Go to first stand up. Who says so? Uh? Huh? You think my house straight away can sell? Uh? Don't ever. You see? So we don't understand what kingship is. We think God is prime minister. What is God reigns? God reigns means he rules over all. Every dimension of your life, including who you choose to be boyfriend, girlfriend. Oops. But the Lord sits and throne forever. He established his throne for justice. In other words, God rules and therefore his laws has consequences if you break them. He is kind in his justice and he is just in his kindness. God establishes his throne in heaven. His kingdom rules over all. And that's what the psalmist say. For God, His way is perfect. The word of God is flawless. He shields all those who take refuge in Him. You know, in olden days, when you come under the protection of the king, into the borders of the king, you are under the protection of the king. You choose not to be in the border of the king, you are open to any attacks of the enemy. But once you step into the border of our land, you are under the covering of the king. That's why you use the word covering. You step under the covering of the king. We can talk about that one day. This is a verse in which many of us know the old song. He is the wrong. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. You know the song? A God of righteousness. A God of truth without injustice. Good and upright is he. Well, ascribe greatness to our God the king. The Lord, never mind. 
Don't worry. One day I'll sing it. Say so down memory lane. But he says this, his ways are just and he is upright. That's what Deuteronomy records. They are saying, God, even though I don't understand, but your ways are just, your ways are perfect. And if we choose God to be our king, then his justice, his truth has to be acceptable to us whether we understand it or not because he is king. And if he reigns in your life, we have to understand that. You see, so in the Old Testament, God was leading his people into battle. Not Joshua. Joshua is just the general. Who gives the order? God. And God says, I want you to walk one round. Joshua never said, oh God, you see, we already come up with a few plans, you know. We actually come from a site here, another site here, and then they're going to repel, you know, by here, you know. No, God said, no, walk one round, last day, walk more round, and then shout. God is the one, because he is king. And therefore, when they went in the eye, they didn't ask God to just, enough, lah, two, three thousand, no problem. They didn't even check their camp. And so this is important to understand. If you choose God to be God, and king of your life, remember he reigns over all. Yeah. Thirdly, choose life. Every choice has consequence we know, and we need to choose life. And that's why the whole point of God bringing you into his wonderful life is so the decisions we make reflect his life, so that his life and his goodness flows through us, and others are blessed with life, not death. Because what you harvest, you will harvest what you plant. You will reap what you sow. And therefore, if you choose life and sow life, you would reap life. Amen? Yep. Next one. And anyway, we're finishing. And therefore, in practicality, we need to have self-judgment and self-examination. Now, we now read this part. It's pretty long. How did they find Achan? Did Achan confess? No? You say, yeah, he said what? I'm the one who did it. No, actually, he was forced to confess. Yep. This is what they did. God said, next day, get everybody ready. In other words, they cast lot. Now, there are different methods of lot. Yep. So one way could be, you know, you put your hand inside your bag. If I take out a black stone, means your group, guilty. White stone, maybe. I don't know, okay? I don't know what color stones they use or what kind they use, but they have a method of casting lots, okay, and they believe the Holy Spirit or God will lead them in it. So, they get everybody there, you're standing there, two million people, all the 12 tribes, and then he goes there, he take, okay, not this tribe, not this tribe, not this tribe, not this tribe, okay. Early morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was chosen. After the 12 tribes, he says, dang, black is the tribe of Judah. Okay, this one white, 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 black. Okay, everybody else, stand aside. Now, we go by clan. Okay? This clan, that clan. White, 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 black. Now, we go by generation, by the children. You, 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 and then you. Okay? The clan of Judah came forward. Zerites were chosen. He had the clan of Zerites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. And Joshua had his family come forward, man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Okay? It is you. Now, I ever thought about that. No? It is, a, to me, time was given to Achan to repent. He didn't confess. No? He was found out. If he wasn't found out, he wouldn't confess at all. Now, if you were in that state, do you know how fearful you are? You say, I hope you take the right stone. I hope it's not one of our family members. At that moment, you are looking. You know, let's say if you are our boy, always like to take things. So imagine going through it. You know, it's going down the thing. It's going down the pressure. The fear of the judgment is going to come. One, it is a physical understanding, or and 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 you know that you know this can happen. It's like in school time, you know, people point out to you, 
during my school time, right, you know, we had gangster fight in our school, and so the whole front five had to line up in the field for police identification. You know, that was one of the highlights of my school. Yeah, uh, we, we had different groups of racist gangs that didn't like each other, but they unite together in the name of our school. <laughs> and so during Teacher's Day, they went across the next school and attacked the other school <laughs> and come back. So there was a police identification. So all the front fire, every class stand there. And then the guy who got hit was like, <laughs> So it's like going that way. You know, Blackstone, Blackstone. Wow, it's serious. Think about that. He didn't confess. He didn't confess. He was caught. He didn't repent. That's why it's a, such a reminder that when we take Holy Communion, we are always called to do that. We don't read this. You know, sometimes we read, some people say, Pastor, why Holy Communion so long? It's so long so that you actually examine yourself. First Corinthians says this, So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. And that is why many of you are weak, sick, and some of you have died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So it's so important. Yeah. Now please do not go, some of you say, Oh, Pastor, is that the reason why I'm sick? Sometimes you are sick because you are sick, lah. Okay, you're getting old. In this world, we will get old. Doesn't mean that Christians will never be sick or Christians will never die. Yeah? If Christians never die, all oh, the Christian mortician got nothing to do. It is no, it is a lousy business then. We will all have to die, the Bible says. That is the reality of life and the finality of life. Okay? But it's that we need to always have a repentful heart before the Lord. That's why thinking soberly, examining yourself is so important. Never assume that, oh, I'm okay. Right? And never assume someone just come to church, they are okay. Because we never know whether they are having something. That's why the Bible talks, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not, yourself, do you know your, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are disqualified? Paul says, test yourself, examine yourself. Unless you are, have been disqualified, then yeah, no need lah. But if you are a Christian, examine yourself constantly. Lest when you are about to finish the race, you disqualify yourself, or you stumble, you fall, you trip, and you never finish the race. Yeah? Lack of self-examination can lead to ongoing self-deception. Very important to know that. Means you think you are okay. I'm okay. I am do the same thing. Ma. I say the right thing. I'm around so around what? In fact, I'm better than the other people. Remember the Pharisees, whenever you say, I'm better than someone else, that's a scary thing. In fact, I tell you, I'm proud to be a humble man. Boy, that's very scary. That's why the scripture says this, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, see if there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the way of everlasting. We need to always allow, ask God to search ourselves. Amen? True self-examination must be done with the Holy Spirit for He searches the deep depths of our lives. So what can you do? Practicality. Let the Word of God search you. If you read the Word of God, don't just scale around the information. Let the Word of God actually be that truth and open prison doors for you. Let it speak to you. What does it say to you personally? Okay? Not what it says to your husband or wife or your children. What it says to you. Yep. I, I'm thankful that in my life as a Christian and as a pastor, you know, occasionally I have people who come to me and uh, praise God for that. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm surprised that God speaks to them in their quiet time that what they were reading that morning was for me, not for them. Yeah, I see, Pastor, this morning I was doing my quiet time. Uh, this words, uh, I feel God is speaking to you. So it's one, one of those things that morning I, I didn't feel I need to do quiet time because someone else did it for me. Yeah. So the Word of God such as other people, not you. But we need to let the Word of God search ourselves. Ask God to search you and show you where your sin is and confess your sins. We all know the scripture. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins 
and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is the assurance of repentance. Uh, sorry, forgiveness that God has for us. And as we end, at the end of the day, we are representative of Christ. We represent Christ, we are God's ambassador, and we reflect Christ in this world. And so every action that we do, okay, will have an effect on your name. Yeah. I'm sure all of you know, when I work in a law firm at the time, my boss said this, hey guys, uh, you all lose money, never mind. Don't lose the reputation of the company. Correct or not? Everybody in business know that, right? And likewise, the same thing. When you do something that ignores the thing of God, the word of God, the direction of God, it affects your name. It affects your family. It affects your ministry. It affects your disciples, your church, your connect group, your studies where you are, your businesses. God's name. God's name. And so it's very important. That's why people say to you, Hiya, you know that fellow in the office, he say he's a Christian, so he also like that one. Have you heard? So how does it affect your name as a Christian? And how does it affect the name of the Lord? You see? So there are always that reminder for us. We are representatives of Christ outside in the marketplace. And so we are called to let shine our lives shine so that people will see the good works that God is doing in our lives and glorify God. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you here today. We, we're going to stand here as a people, Lord, and say that we are not perfect. Lord. We are men and women with unclean lips and unclean hearts. And Father, you know what is in our hearts, what runs in our minds, O oh Lord. And, and, and things that have gone through our hearts, O oh Lord, that sometimes we hold it, Father. And, and, and we allow it to, 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 to become, O oh Lord, a, a stumbling block in our lives. But yet, Lord, we put it aside in a closet, hoping that no one sees, no one hopes, no one understands, O oh Lord. But Lord, you see. And so this day, Lord... Things, Lord, that we have said, spoken, thought about, considered, all in our hearts, Father, that betrays us before you, things that we choose not to do, even you have spoken to us. Lord, we, we ask for you to forgive us. Forgive us, O oh Lord, because we let you down. For as David would say, Lord, against you alone, Lord, have I sinned. Father, we ask, Lord, Father, that you bring, O oh Lord, healing in our own hearts. That you bring, O oh Lord, wholeness in our hearts. That you bring that, O oh Lord, restoration once again, O oh Lord, to that joy of salvation we once had. Father, O oh Lord, we give our lives to you. We surrender our lives to you. We consecrate our lives to you this day. So that, Lord, the things that you want to do in our lives can be done for you. Father, Thank you.
see 